Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction, what we think is the best show on the web for all things infertility. I am Dr. Rahi Victory, a fertility specialist here in Canada with US board certification. Nice to have you all join us. Um, we have a really cool topic tonight, which is whether or not your first beta HCG test value is predictive of a live birth and if the level needs to be changed based on your age. So super interesting topic. I don't think anyone's ever looked at it before in this way. And uh, this was a great study. So I thought I'd bring it to everybody's attention. And uh, we'll, as usual, take all your questions after we uh, review the topic. Um, special thanks to uh, Tarek from uh, Ibrahim Strategies Group, who is uh, running the show as always, off to the side. And I think I want to start a contest for people to send in their ideas of what Tarek looks like, because he has been our mystery guy <laughs> for some time now. So uh, he's like the Stig from uh, um, the uh, car show. Uh, in the UK. So uh, let us know what you think. Um, in the meantime, we are um, uh, super excited to have you all join. And uh, like I said, we've got a great topic. So we'll give everybody a second to jump on. Um, feel free to start asking your questions now. We do tend to take them in sequence. So if you ask now, we will answer them, but be patient and watch the first part. And we will get through to the second part of the show. Um, are we good for audio? Yeah, we are. All right, great. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is uh, just briefly before we start and to give everybody a chance to jump on is everybody is still panicked and worried about the COVID vaccines and fertility. So I've been watching some of my um, colleagues and uh, friends out there on social media who have postings about the vaccine and the amount of people out there that still think that this negatively impacts your fertility is astonishing. So let's deal with the basics. Number one, there is not a single study in existence that shows that the COVID vaccines negatively impact your fertility. Number two, there is at least one study and now a second one coming out that shows that being vaccinated actually may be beneficial in terms of preventing miscarriages. And certainly we know that the risks of pregnancy from getting COVID are very, very high. And the risks of pregnancy from being vaccinated are zero, literally zero. There is no pregnancy risk associated with being vaccinated. So uh, the things that are being said are still completely nonsensical from the standpoint of someone that lives and breathes this every day. It's actually quite ironic seeing what other people say, in some cases, almost laughable. The best example is this study of how the fat droplets are accumulating in the ovary. Okay, so the study that looked at fat droplets accumulating in the ovary was a study in which they gave 1,333 times the human dose of the COVID vaccine to a rat. And then they dissected the rats and they looked at their ovaries and found that 0.1% of the vaccine ended up in the ovaries. Okay, well, if I gave anybody 1,333 times of anything, you'd end up with 0.1% of it in your ovaries. So the studies that are out there that people are referencing, they are abusing to drive their agenda and I have no idea what their agenda is or why it is what it is, but it's maniacal that people are using this and saying, oh, look, it's damaging ovaries. It does not damage ovaries. It has no negative impact on your ovaries. It couldn't have a negative impact on your ovaries if you wanted it to. So it's very, very important that people understand that they need to be vaccinated. So please stop listening to all the people out there that are putting out stuff that is absolute nonsense and get yourself vaccinated as quickly as you can. Okay, so tonight's topic is a up and coming article uh, called the predictive value of serum human chorionic gonadotropin concentrations for pregnancy outcomes of in vitro fertilization in women of different ages. So essentially what they wanted to see was, does it make a difference in regards to your age, what the predictive threshold of your first beta HCG test is, and should we adjust the threshold based on age? So this is being done in a center in China. A lot of great IVF work actually comes out of China because they have such huge numbers uh, of cycles. 
um, and a very robust academic kind of environment. Um, so essentially what they did was <clears throat> they selected patients who had undergone a frozen embryo transfer only. They used only grade four and high or fair quality embryos. So AA, AB, BA, BB, or AC, CA, BC, and CB, but not CC or CD or anything below that. Um, and they were all grade four, so these were expanded blastocysts or further. And they took all of the patients that they had found within the time frame that they were looking at, and they examined what their outcomes were. So several kind of interesting things. Number one, they didn't use anyone with donor eggs. They didn't use anybody using natural cycles. They were all programmed hormone-based cycles. Um, they didn't use anyone that had a day seven blastocyst, which is important. And um, they didn't have any uh, transfers of monozygotic twinning cycles where you had twins or ones that ended up with ectopic. So they excluded all of those. They just looked at the ones that were coming out with a single live birth uh, outcome and or pregnancy at least, clinical pregnancy, and then subsequently live birth. Um, if they had patients with fibroids, they removed them. Um, they took all the normal precautions and it was quite standardized. So they broke their study group up into three groups. There was group A, which was less than 30 years of age. Group B, was, which was 30 to 34 years of age. And group C, which was 35 years and greater. And that's important to remember because we're gonna show you some, some data slides in a minute. Okay, so um, what they did was they analyzed how many patients that they had um, and found that initially there were 876 cycles, but they had to exclude some because of inappropriate blastocysts that were applied or they had uh, not done their blood test on the right day and so on. And interestingly, and we certainly don't do this here, but maybe I'll change based on the study, these folks are testing on day 10 after their frozen embryo transfer. So 10 days after the frozen embryo transfer, they are testing to see what the beta HCG level is at. Most places wait 14 days, 16 days. These guys are checking on day 10. So they ended up with 772 cycles in total um, from uh, June 2016 to December 2019 and 566 cycles ended up in a positive HCG test 10 days after the transfer. So that was a 56.09% um, clinical pregnancy rate and a 44.95% live birth rate subsequently. So we're gonna show you the first figure, which is figure two, that's the one with the two little graphs. And um, these are called area under the car curve graphs or ROC graphs, okay? So what they did with this is demonstrate that there is a threshold that gives you very high sensitivity and very high specificity for both clinical pregnancy and live birth. So for clinical pregnancy, the beta had to be 113.28 millionths, international units per milliliter. And for live birth, it was 146. So what does that mean? If you got a value uh, 10 days after your frozen embryo transfer of 146.37, you had an extremely high chance of resulting in that live birth. So 95%, or sorry, 92% uh, area under the curve, which gave you a sensitivity of 94.8% and a specificity of 82.4%. So very, very robust, robust numbers, highly predictive, okay? When they analyzed this further, what they then said was, let's look at what factors actually contributed to the value, the HCG value, and they looked at weight and age and um, your endometrial thickness and your blastocyst quality and, and how many days your blastocyst was and so on and so forth. So with that, if we go to table two, you have table two there. So looking at table two there, you can see that age was predictive. So less than 30, you had the positive p-value, 30 to 34, you had the positive p-value. They're using greater than 35 as their reference. So those groups have higher success rates, um, much, much higher based on age. So obviously the younger you are, the higher the predictive value and that we all know already. What's interesting here is that they found that the blastocyst quality 
was the only other thing that was significant, and that was extremely significant, showing that the lower the quality of the blast assist, the lower the chances of success. And in this uh, particular analysis, it's a 70% reduction in success. So a huge, huge difference if your blast assist quality is poorer compared to higher grade embryos. So we always talk about the embryo grade. Some studies say it's important, some say it does not. What this is predicting is not necessarily the live birth, but the fact that these factors were predictive of the HCG, which then in turn was predictive of clinical pregnancy or live birth. So then they went on further, and um, you can go to maybe table four if that's okay. So they analyzed whether or not your age played a role. So in table three, which I'm not gonna show you, they demonstrated that in the different groups, if you use that 113 clinical pregnancy beta HCG value, that the sensitivity and specificity and the positive and negative predictive values dropped with each age group. So in the initial group A, you have a 96 uh, percent positive predictive value. I mean, that's insanely high, right? That's fantastic. So you get a beta of 113. You basically are saying there's a 96% chance you're going to end up with a baby at the end of it, okay? Or in this case, a clinical pregnancy. When they looked at group B, it dropped down to 94.6%. And when you get to group C, it dropped down to 88.7%. So very, very significant differences based on age. You're dropping almost 10% in predictive value from going less than 30 to over 35. And that's not even that big a time span. Like I would have thought they would have made it even wider. And I'm sure the data would be even more robust if they looked at an over 40 age group. So in table four, what you can see is they rejigged the numbers. So they said for group A, if we use a uh, level of 145, your positive predictive value is 98%. So if you get a 145, you got a 98% chance of ending up with a clinical pregnancy, which is a baby with a heartbeat. In group B, in order to maintain that same kind of threshold of very high 95.8%, you needed a beta of 126. So a lower beta when you're older is still gonna correlate with a very high chance of a pregnancy. And the really interesting thing is that when you're in group C, you're over the age of 35, you can actually tolerate an even lower level of beta. It's only 94.44, and you're still getting a relatively robust chance. Now, the numbers do drop off. You're looking at about an 88% chance or predictive value. So it's not quite as strong, but they did demonstrate a very high negative predictive value, meaning if your beta is below that, there's a very good chance that you will not result in a clinical pregnancy. So if your beta 10 days after your frozen embryo transfer is less than 94, you have an extremely high chance that that will not go on to be a meaningful pregnancy, unfortunately. So this is really a game changer for us because when we advise patients, we say, oh yeah, your beta is over a certain threshold, then we're happy. But this is actually saying that you should be changing that threshold based on the patient's age. And now we can actually give patients rock solid information with data to say, you have this percentage chance of moving forward or this percentage chance it's not gonna move forward. And so that's very, very valuable data for us. So is it a factor of fiction that the beta can predict a live birth and that age makes a difference in which beta? It's actually a fact that the beta does make a difference and we should be following specific values for specific age groups. Now, what are the drawbacks of this study? Well, for sure, they're looking at a very select population. They were all Asian patients, obviously, so how applicable it is to the rest of the world, I don't know. Um, it should be similar nevertheless. Uh, their BMI groups were not quite as high, so how much of a role that plays in the North American population where BMI tends to play more of a role can be significant. And then of course, although this was a fairly large study, in the grand scheme of things, we're not talking about thousands of cycles, we're talking about 722. So more data would be even more impressive. And this may be something that we can kind of figure out from looking at other research databases. So I'm hoping I might be able to access that. So this is a very, very rich, interesting study, which gives us some really key information we never had before, that your age in predicting your outcome 
can make a difference just specifically looking at a positive beta. So if you got that positive preg test and you're cringing, you want to keep coming back to make sure it's doubling, this is actually telling you, you might not even need to do that. You may be able to tell just from that first beta based on how high your chances are um, with numbers like 98% positive predictive value. So thank you for watching that part of the show. Hopefully you've all been uh, watching and asking your questions in the meantime. We are gonna take your questions now. We do find from time to time that um, some members have drifted away and then come back and we do answer your questions. So if you've asked your question twice, um, if we're not answering it the second time around, it's because we've already answered it. So just go back and watch the show again later. Remember, all of our videos are on YouTube. So uh, if you want to watch them there, you can certainly watch them there. And we are uh, happy to uh, uh, review any topics with you if you ask us. Not a problem at all. So uh, I'm ready to take questions. What have you got? So this one came from YouTube. Okay. Um, four days ago. Oh, wow. So they had a question on there and they wanted to They are on the ball. They are on the ball. <laughs> and I thought this would be the first question we open up with. All right, cool. So she said, um, not sure if you will see this, but I had issues with an email before and bleeding to where I needed a blood transfusion. Wow. Okay. Um, I was on BC for three months and my cycles have become more regular. Okay. Would I still be at risk and likely unable to take aspirin because of previous bleeding issues? Um, it depends on why you were bleeding. So if you were bleeding because of a bleeding disorder, you definitely shouldn't be taking aspirin. But if you were bleeding because of a fibroid or because of your hormones being out of whack, um, that's a completely different story and we should be looking at that. So um, you need to know if it's a bleeding disorder issue or if it's an issue of heavy bleeding related to something else. Um, certainly, if it's the something else, it's manageable. If it's a bleeding disorder, you should not be on a blood thinner for sure. It's a great question. No one's ever asked us that. Very true. Very true. Hopefully, if you're watching the show from YouTube, you've got your answer. If not, it'll be on YouTube. We should probably type an answer to that yeah. one too. Uh, okay. So I want to get All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, I am ready to go. Okay. Uh, Dr. Victory, if a patient doesn't do well with Lupron flare protocol, but does better with antagonists, is that a sign of poor egg quality or low fertility? Thank you. No, um, all of these various uh, STEM protocols have been studied in great detail. And there is absolutely not a shred of proof that any of them are any better than any others. So we hear about estrogen priming, testosterone priming, DHEA, human growth hormone, uh, long protocol, short protocol, antagonist, or Lupron flare. They're all the same. Letrozole, Clomid, they're all the same. It doesn't make any difference. You can try them all, or you can just try one. You're going to essentially get the same outcome. Now, are some better with some practices or in some patients? Sure, and that's why I don't believe in cookie-cutter medicine. We try different things for different patients. But I like the microdose flare protocol because for us, it tends to work well. Um, I also like the antagonist protocol. We very rarely use the long down regulation protocol because in this day and age, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me, but um, a lot of people still use it and they have good success rates. So we are very uh, open to whatever you know patients want and whatever their physician wants. Um, but at the same time, I know factually it doesn't make any difference at all. So you can't say that because you did poorly with a flare protocol, but did well with an antagonist protocol that it's a reflection on your egg quality. It isn't. Yeah, not at all. Um, next question. Hi, Dr. Victory. Could you explain <clears throat> the difference between Lupron and Lupron plus Letrozole for endometriosis? What does the Letrozole do? Thanks. So um, Lupron suppresses your FSH and LH so that you should be producing very, very little estrogen from your ovaries, but it has no impact on peripheral estrogen production. Letrozole can prevent you from making estrogen anywhere in your body. So as a result of that, you can de decrease the overall level of estrogen better by putting patients on Letrozole and Lupron um, together. I think I said overall level of letrozole, overall level of estrogen better by putting them on Lupron and letrozole. So um, we reviewed a study a while back that demonstrated that for unexplained infertility, 
Patients who went on Lupron and Letrozole for three months had a much higher success rate when they went to do their embryo transfer. And the rationale is most of those patients probably have endo. And as a result, you are completely crushing the endo and therefore it improves your success rate. So we use that protocol now for our endo patients. Now, people have done studies of Lupron before an embryo transfer. In fact, there was one just out. And they have not been able to show that it reduces or changes your success rates, but that's because they were on Lupron alone. But Lupron plus letrozole is not the same thing as Lupron alone. And so it's important to look at that protocol or that attempt as well. So that's what the letrozole is doing. It is helping to completely shut off the estrogen from peripheral conversion for at least a few months. When doing dual stem, are you supposed to have more follicles in the luteal phase compared to follicular phase? No, not necessarily. Um, in fact, we find a lot of times you have less follicles in the luteal than the follicular, but the embryo quality, if you look at all of the studies, suggests that it's better from the luteal phase follicle than it is from the follicular phase ones. Um, and people I just found out recently are doing uh, the duo stems differently. So I know at least one clinic in Toronto, um, because I was talking to someone on Instagram the other night, um, is just giving patients three days of uh, cetratide right after they do their first retrieval, and then jumping into the next cycle. I follow the study that was on fertility and sterility, where they really broke this and we reviewed it on the show. Um, and so what they did in their study was wait five days with no meds and then start another stimulation altogether. <clears throat> so that was uh, um, the protocol they use. Um, the patient I was speaking to did not feel that she was doing particularly well, but it was super early in her cycle. So um, you're supposed to wait a while because it is a separate cohort. So going back to back, I don't think is really going to make sense or work, but I don't know. They were also gouging the patient. Um, they were charging an astronomical amount of money for their duo stim cycle, almost twice what we charge. So uh, make sure you're getting fair treatment wherever you're going. Um, there are a lot of places in Toronto that like to gouge. Um, uh, if you're paying $19,000 for one cycle and then another 9,000 for your duo stim cycle, that's insane. We charge like 16,000 for both cycles. Um, so we're cheaper for two than we are, than they are for one. Um, so make sure you're getting fair treatment, guys. This isn't about money. It's about helping people. Is it possible to go into an FET on the next cycle after a dual stim, or do I need to take a break? Um, you could go into an FET after a dual stim. You would have to wait for your next, next period because your period is going to occur um, in sync with when you had your first retrieval done. But because you're going to start having progesterone left over from the corpus luteae of the eggs you've removed or follicles you've aspirated, your progesterone is going to be long into the next cycle. So you still have to gap one month between the, the actual second retrieval, wait for your next period, and then check everything and then go ahead. So we don't try and force people to do it quickly. We actually leave a little gap so their system goes back to normal. You are definitely messing with people's physiology doing a duo stem. Yeah, so, so you need a gap for sure. If I froze eggs, but some of the eggs frozen were not mature upon retrieval, they matured in the lab, should I not have high expectations that those eggs will result in a baby? Um, so eggs that are matured in the lab generally don't do well. Um, there was a study out I want to say about eight or nine months ago that demonstrated that there is some hope, but it's quite low for those eggs that we have to mature. So when you go in and you do an egg retrieval and you get some that are M1 instead of M2, um, the number that are uh, going to end up in a viable embryo, I forget the exact number, but I think it was like somewhere around 11 or 13%. It's pretty, pretty low. Um, so for sure with frozen eggs, which already has a lower success rate, unfortunately, you are going to probably see a lack of response. Is it possible they'll fertilize? Yes. But is it likely? No. Um, the best example I can give you 
is that I have at least two patients I now believe that likely have FSH receptor mutations. So we are going to possibly do egg retrievals on them without even trying to grow their eggs because their eggs don't grow. Um, so we looked up a technique that works apparently. And when you look at the study, the study is referencing about a 30% overall uh, pregnancy rate. So it's certainly not anywhere close to the 80% that we're getting or expecting. Um, so interesting, um, but not gonna be kind of robust the way we would like it to be. So there's at least a chance, but it's not gonna be what you would like. So definitely freezing eggs is gonna be even worse because now you're taking the eggs and not just maturing them and, and fertilizing them, you're actually maturing them and then freezing them, then you're gonna have to thaw them, then you gotta inject them, and then you may need to freeze them again depending on how many embryos you make. So that's probably not ideal. Sorry. What would you recommend for a couple who were the, who where the female <laughs> has been thrift, a tubal ligation, and the male has been through testicular cancer with orchidotomy with direct radiation who have had already gone through two full rounds of IVF, more IVF or a tubal reversal? Um, well, if he still has his other testis and it's producing viable sperm, it would depend on your age. We have reviewed tubal reversal versus IVF. It is age dependent in terms of your results. I actually just did two tubal reversals in Toronto yesterday. Um, so it depends on your age um, and the rest of your history and what his sperm is like. But if you failed two cycles of IVF, I would first wanna know why you failed two cycles of IVF before I'd let you spend any money on anything. Um, so case like yours are actually the ones I really love to deal with. So reach out and I'll help you out. Um, so we'll figure it out together. We need to determine why you failed two cycles of IVF and then we can have a discussion about what the appropriate next step would be. Um, it certainly wouldn't hurt to try a tubal ligation, but it also depends on who tied your tubes, how they were tied, um, you know, what his sperm quality is like, what's the rest of your health like, and so on. Yeah, great question though. I, I'd be happy to help you. I love the cases that are challenging, so reach out and we'll set up an appointment. Um, you can contact us by just asking at info, I-N-F-O, at drvictory, drvictory.com. Um, tell in put in the email that I said I'd um, uh, want to speak to you as soon as possible, and then uh, we'll chat with you and see what we can do. Uh, thoughts on mito score? Um, mito score is really interesting. So there's data that says that it's very helpful, and there's data that says that it's epically useless. Um, it was a big thing for a little while because they made it a big thing, but right now virtually nobody is using it anymore because there was one study that said it did not um, facilitate better embryo selection. Uh, so I don't use it anymore. Um, it wasn't really that helpful, so I, I'm not sure it's really proving to be that beneficial, um, but it's, it's available. <clears throat> How long is a CLN sonohistogram valid for? How often does it need to get repeated ahead of an FET? Um, minimum once a year. Um, depends on what you've gone through and what's happened to you in between. So, for example, if you have a history of lots of fibroids, you may need it every six months if you keep regrowing them. Um, if you've had a DNC, you may need another one to make sure things are okay. If you had a hysteroscopy and they took out a fibroid or did something that could potentially scar your uterus, you would need to to get a, another one done. So normally we'd say once a year, um, could be more, but usually once a year. And I hope you all saw my post on HSG versus SIS. There's a ton of HSGs being done in the US. I genuinely don't understand that. It makes no sense whatsoever. Less information, radiation exposure, probably more expensive and gives you like way more pain. So I don't understand why people aren't doing the SIS, but Again, being in Canada, I may be missing something about the US. Maybe the US insurers are not paying for it. Um, but make sure you jump on that post and comment because we had about 120 comments there. So it'd be great to see what you guys think. 4% male sperm morphology. Yep. 53 million sperm. Okay. IUI with letrozole or mini IUI? Is mini, I, is mini worth the money? Mini IUI or 
Oh, like with a little bit of shots? Um, yeah, you'll probably see about a 10% increase in your success. Um, so normally letrozole and IUI, you're looking somewhere around 10 to 15%. Um, if you're doing uh, shots in IUI, you're probably looking more around 20 to 25%. So yeah, I mean, it, it could be worth it. If you have drug coverage, it's worth it. If you don't have drug coverage, I never advocate for that because your chances of success are not good enough to justify the enormity of the increase in cost. So yeah, if you've got drug coverage, go for it. If you don't have drug coverage, don't do it. I think last week you mentioned that your FET protocol includes taking a probiotic. Do you have a recommendation for a probiotic? Um, so we use Flora. I don't think it really makes a difference. So, um, and strictly technically speaking, in Canada, we can't promote one thing over another. So I, I don't really do that, but we use Flora. Um, I don't really believe that anything is unique about Flora, but that's what they carry in our pharmacy. Our naturopath supported it. So I went with her suggestion, that's all. What are your thoughts about the COVID booster shot? Got my second dose in June and planning a transfer next cycle. Um, if you're referring to third dose, um, I think whether you like it or not, we're all going to be getting it. So Delta is very strong. By the time Delta hits hard, it'll likely be December. Um, do not be shocked if you go into yet another shutdown. Um, and unfortunately, when that one's done, undoubtedly there will be some other variant by that time that is coming out and, and then replacing Delta. Um, so getting these extra shots has been shown to have an enormous increase in your antibody titers. And as a result, obviously the drug companies are promoting it and most likely public health, uh, public health agencies will be as well. So don't be surprised if you need to get a third shot. Um, right now, I spoke with an Israeli couple today and uh, they were telling me that um, I think something like a million people in Israel have already received their third dose. Um, so they are going full bore into protecting the population. So um, it's coming, whether you like it or not, you'll be getting a third dose. Big question. Okay. Hi, Dr. Victory. You said that you incorporate vaginal <laughs> probiotics in an FET. Is it okay to administer probiotics vaginally if you're also doing endometrium? Or do you stop the probiotic beforehand? No, you can do them both at the same time. There's no reason not to. Yeah. The hormones aren't going to alter the impact of the probiotics. Keep in mind, in a natural situation, you have bacteria in your vagina and in your uterus some of which are supposed to be there and some of which are not in some cases, and your hormones are going up and down. So um, that's a natural thing. So having the hormone directly in the vagina um, with the, the probiotic is not a major issue. Now, endometrin does gush out fluid. Um, so could it wash out some of the probiotic? Maybe. Um, there's certainly no studies on that, but I guess in theory, some of it may wash out with the little blast of fluid you eject out. So um, it's hard to know, but um, yeah, I don't think the hormone part of it's gonna affect anything. For patients over 35 with no DOR who failed three plus rounds of IUI with letrozole despite responding well multiple follicles, is it worth asking for workup for endometriosis or implantation issues? Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know that I'd go with the implantation issues because um, that's a different story. So uh, you don't wanna invest into that because that's actually quite expensive. Those are the tests we do all the time, um, but it's pricey. So if you're gonna go into IVF, then yes, it'd probably be worth looking at that. But if you're not gonna do IVF, I wouldn't ever encourage anybody to pay for all those tests to do more IUI. Now, there's two really critical things about that question. Number one, if you're under 35, um, and in fact, under 38, and you've only done three cycles of IUI, you can still do three more cycles of IUI and expect an increase in your success rate. So you're not at the threshold of where we throw in the towel. Having said that, we personally do like to change things after three failed cycles. So surgery is a great option. I talk to all my patients about that if they failed three. And we also talk about moving from, let's say, letrozole to doing shots to get a slightly better chance. 
but I wouldn't just keep doing the same thing over and over. We normally want to change it up at least a little bit. Is it possible that endometriosis is involved? For sure. And as part of that, you need to figure that out by doing your testing um, and go for your consult and determine, you know, what's right for you and what's not right for you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm 38, have five failed FETs diagnosed with unexplained and have one five day embryo remaining. Wow. My dog Sorry. is not helpful and also diagnosed me unexplained. That's so bad. Any hope working with you on my last FET? Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't touch your embryo until I know why you failed five FETs, right? So um, fertilicist testing, immunological testing, um, find out more about you, find out about your partner, uh, thrombophilia screen sometimes, um, look at your lining, uh, see if you've had surgery for endometriosis, find out what kind of protocol they were using for you. I don't do it unless I anticipate success. So um, we would not even talk to you about doing an embryo transfer until I know what's wrong. And if I can't figure out what's wrong, then we got to have a really long talk because it's your last embryo. So are we putting it into you or are we putting it into somebody else as a surrogate? If we are going to put it into you, are we going to use a protocol which at least tries to mitigate all of the possibilities? So do we use an immune protocol even if you come back negative? Um, and these are the kinds of discussions I have with my patients because I'm totally not into cookie cutter medicine. Um, we always make sure that we're doing what's best for you as an individual. So I wouldn't just say, hey, you know, let's just do the same thing again. I mean, five frozen embryo transfers with no success, um, that's extremely, extremely, extremely rare. Uh, so there should be a solution and a path forward for you. Yeah. Are you able to do a FET, the cycle after the day? after the egg retrieval, or do we have to wait for the following cycle? Um, can I? Yes. Um, do we recommend it? Not always, because not everybody's hormones come down fast enough. Um, plus, there's a lot of pressure built up in the ovaries, depending on how many um, follicles we aspirated. So can we? Yes. Do we? Occasionally. Um, is it routine? We usually wait one cycle in between, and then we do it. Yeah, but that's just to protect you. What are your thoughts on Receptiva DX test? How many times have we been asked that, do you think? Once a show? Yeah, yeah. yeah. At least once a show. And when I read it, I always find it. Yeah, Receptiva is useless, um, so don't waste your money. It doesn't tell you anything, guys, so don't, don't do Receptiva. It is not useful in predicting endometriosis, and it's not helpful in predicting implantation, so don't bother. Waste of money, waste of time. When is the best time to start taking melatonin before an IVF cycle? Is it true it changes the natural cycle and is better to use only during the IVF? Sorry, say that again? Yeah. When is the best time to start taking melatonin? Oh, melatonin. Before an IVF cycle? Yeah. And is it true it changes the natural cycle and is better to use only during the IVF <laughs> cycle? Uh, nope, you can use it the whole time, um, although the studies have all looked at it in terms of embryo transfer, but women that are on melatonin have a higher success rate. It's anywhere from about 20 to, uh, sorry, 18 to like 26% or so, I think, um, more successful when you're on melatonin. So we just put patients on it the whole time, but um, frequently we focus on it for the frozen embryo transfer where it's most important. Day seven embryo tested euploid. Seems like not a lot of clear data on chances with day seven normal embryos. Um, actually, there was a recent study that looked at that. Um, the chances are reasonable, but they're not as good as a day five or a day six euploid embryo. Um, if it took till day seven to develop, while it's genetically normal, it likely does not have the um, energy efficiency uh, mechanisms or materials or, or supplies needed to help the embryo develop rapidly and that can impede the implantation and the growth and so on of the embryo. So um, people were asking about MitoScore earlier in the show. That's actually an example of where MitoScore might be useful. Um, those embryos are probably not mechanistically built to um, divide as quickly and as robustly as they should. 
that may impede their development, and that's what the study shows. So there is a study that has looked at that. It was about uh, two months ago I saw that, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know what? I read a lot of studies. <laughs> I see that. I see that. I read for you guys nonstop, like pretty much every day, four or five journals. Um, and I stay on top of it constantly, which is why you guys see the articles before they're even out yet. Yeah. Okay. It's a big one. Are we missing Instagram? Or are you asking questions off of Instagram? I'm going to say I don't know off Instagram. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know. What are your thoughts on waiting two years to do IVF? We are getting married, and it has been a very stressful time and expensive time with the planning. I'm 33 years old, female, good egg releasal, and good hormones. Issues on male side, age 46. Would you consider egg freezing or sperm freezing if he can increase the quality of his sperm? We are getting married in two years and plan on doing IVF right after the wedding if there would be no problems with waiting. Um, so if his sperm is not good, I would definitely recommend freezing some sperm. That's easy. If you're 33, there's not going to be a huge difference between 33 and 35. You will see a slight decrease in success, but your chances are still good. But I would make sure that you have an actual fertility workup where they give you your AMH, your antral follicle count. If you've got a strong AMH and a good antral follicle count, you don't need to rush. Just freeze his sperm if his sperm isn't good because a 46-year-old male with bad sperm could have nothing in two years. But if his sperm is okay, you're okay, you don't have to rush at 33. Yeah. And don't get stressed. Dr. B, preparing for an FET next week, but there was a tiny pocket of fluid seen in lining, greater than 10 millimeters. Oh, My that's practice not tiny. seems to think that this was dispersed once I started progesterone. Um, what? <laughs> but time for two days before starting PIO, she, she rephrased it. Okay. The doctor thinks it, it'll disperse once PIO is in the system. Would you still cancel if the fluid is no longer there? Um, so fluid comes from three places, either inflammation or infection, an isthmocele, which is that steeple-shaped divot in your uterus where you've had a cesarean section previously, or from fallopian tubes hydrosalpings. So before you do anything, you need to know where it's coming from, because otherwise when they implant your embryo, you've got to remember that your uterus contracts and it's contracting in a wave and the wave is directional. It's going out the cervix. That's how menstruation leaves the uterus. And so if you pop an embryo in there and the fluid is still in there, you're literally surfing your embryo out your cervix. Um, so you cannot put an embryo into a uterus that's filled with fluid. So before you do anything, figure out where the fluid is coming from. That progesterone thing is total nonsense. That's just simply not true. Sorry. I love that one. I love that one. I kind of like it when I tell other people they're wrong. <laughs> Here's a good one. Here's a good one. <laughs> a good one. All right. How important is thrombophilia screening for recurrent losses? If we decide not to do it now, can we do it later if we don't have any success? Okay, so um, it's actually controversial as to whether or not thrombophilias cause recurrent pregnancy loss. I believe they do because when we treat patients that have thrombophilias with heparin, they do fine. And when we don't, they miscarry or have complications in the pregnancy. Um, so I'm a believer in it, but not everybody is. Uh, and there are studies that say that it does not make a difference. So um, can you go ahead and do a cycle of whatever um, without being tested for a thrombophilia? Yes. Uh, are there potential complications? Sure, miscarriage, hypertension, placental abruption, IUGR, um, growth restriction, these sorts of things. Um, can you test later? Well, not if you're pregnant, but if you are not pregnant, you can always test later. Um, in Canada, unless you have insurance coverage for the testing, the testing is actually pretty expensive. It's about 700 bucks. So in many cases, it's actually cheaper to treat the patient than it is to test the patient. So in some instances, we just put them on heparin thinking that 
they may have something or at least trying to prophylax against the possibility that they have something and uh, save them 700 bucks because if their drug plan covers it, you can treat them for less than you can test them for. And I'm all about saving people money. So, um, you know, I think that's a reasonable option. Um, but if you want to get tested and you want to be sure, get tested. That's the best way for sure. Can you remind me of the benefits of taking baby aspirin before an FET? Is it a anti-inflammatory? When should I start and stop in stop it in preparation for FET two? Uh, start it before you do your FET at any point, like even before your prep. Um, stop it when you deliver your baby, um, and not before that. As far as the benefits, um, reduce preeclampsia, we know that for sure. Reduce preterm labor, we know that for sure. Um, improve blood flow, reduced inflammation. So, um, and I think improved success rates. So, um, everybody should be on aspirin, in my opinion. We haven't had an aspirin question for a long time. Yeah. We've got a we got a YouTube video with ten thousand views or something on aspirin. So watch the YouTube video. It's uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, and it's just Doctor Victory Dr Victory, um, and you look at the popular upload section, you can't miss it. It's like about ten videos down because we have somewhat more views. How often do you diagnose a patient unexplained? Just curious. And thanks so much for your informative show. Uh, thank you for the thanks, um, and thank you for watching. Uh, yeah, unexplained is pretty rare. Um, I'm kind of anal about making sure I figure out what's wrong. So I don't call people unexplained until I've checked everything. So that would be surgery to rule out endo, um, hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, the thrombophilia testing, fertilisys testing, immunological testing, like, I won't call you unexplained until I've done everything I can possibly do to determine what's wrong. Um, you know, sperm testing, DNA fragmentation testing, and so on. Um, so it, it's kind of a little more rare for me. If you if you look at the old kind of standard, they would tell you that like 15% of the patients that we see are going to be unexplained, quote unquote. Um, I know Dr. Amy Avazada, um, who's a chum of mine. Um, she also hates the term unexplained infertility. So we really try to figure it out before we call it that because most of the time there is a reason. We just haven't figured it out yet, which is our failing, not yours. You just talked about the immune protocol for an FET cycle. What is the immune protocol? Oh, God. Um, it depends. So we don't have a single immune protocol. It depends on whether we've done immune testing um, it depends on what's wrong from that immune testing. It depends if we're just treating you blindly. The general principles or the tools that we have at our disposal, tacrolimus, um, IVIG, which we rarely use because it's so expensive, subcutaneous IG, uh, prednisone, heparin, intralipids, um, and then lit therapy. So there's a whole host of things that can be used um, and Plaquenil as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff we can use. It depends on what's wrong and what we're aiming for. How often does an FET result in pregnancy of unknown location? I'm baffled. Um, very, very, very rarely if done properly, although those little critters can sometimes find their way up into the fallopian tubes. Um, that has happened to me twice in my career. Um, where we've had ectopics from IVF, but it's a known risk. Um, so IVF does not eliminate your risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. Um, so you do need to still be careful. Uh, it's uncommon, but it does happen. Single digit percentages, but it's still there. I've done two years of various medicated cycles, IUI, IVF, testing, etc. cetera. Ah. During my fourth transfer, monitoring shows three follicles over 12 millimeters at day 10. How long should these drugs stay in system? Well, I'm not sure I understand that question. How long should these drugs stay in the system? Mm -hmm. Three follicles. Uh, sorry, I don't understand that question. I, I'm not sure what you're asking there, dear. Um, if you have growing follicles in preparation for a frozen embryo transfer, then that is... 
uh, something you need to monitor because if the follicles get large enough, you can surge and release them. Um, but in the event that they're just staying the same, I'm not sure what drugs you're referring to. The drugs from your FET will stay in your system depending on which ones you're using for a variable period of time. Sorry, confusing question. Maybe flesh that out a bit for us and we'll see if we get to it again. Tarek and I are starving, by the way, and my incredible wife, Wendy, um, brought us Persian food from Toronto. So we'll give you another 10 minutes and then I gotta go eat because I haven't had breakfast or lunch. I got yeah. a big one. A big it's one. Three posts, so it might not be written the right the first time. Three so. posts, okay, uh oh. Uh -oh. All right, I'm bearing. Okay. Um, You're bearable not, most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Is it not? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> is it not normal for body odor to be more pronounced during your period? <laughs> of all the questions I thought I would get asked. Um, so uh, the blood coming from your menstruation um, does tend to have a bit of a piquant odor. Um, so it's not body odor that's worse, but menstrual odor is definitely there. But body odor, I'm not aware of altering unless you're sweating in response to the decline in estrogen, which I guess is theoretically possible, but not something that normally happens. Every how many hours should it, should it three times a day, 400 milligram progesterone suppository be taken? Also, can Wait, it be inserted? Did someone just ask every how many times a day should it three times a day progesterone? I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> you just read them. Okay, so if you're taking a three times a day progesterone, you need to take it three times a day. So if you're looking at the hourly intervals, I mean, eight hours, but you know, that's often awkward because some people are like not staying up till midnight and then um, doing it. So you can do kind of morning, noon and night. Um, it, it It's not hugely critical that you get it in exactly at the right time. What was the rest of that one? Um, Spots would be taken. Also, can yeah. it be inserted at the same time as estrus pills? Yeah, you can insert them at the same same time. That's not a problem. Um, mm. Actually, I don't think anyone's ever asked us about the spacing of the progesterone. So you don't have to take it like every, like don't set an alarm clock and wake up, just to insert your progesterone. It's not that critical because the levels are so super physiologic, varying it by an hour or two is not gonna make a difference. Do you have patients lay down for a period of time after their frozen transfer? Yeah, we keep them on our bed for 15 minutes. Then they, like our OR bed for 15 minutes. Then they go to the chair and they sit for another 15, 20 minutes and then they go. The day of your frozen transfer, should you take progesterone suppositories, estrus, and aspirin before the transfer? Yeah, um, it depends on what time it is. I mean, if you've got a nine o'clock in the morning transfer and you're scheduled to put it in at eight, just wait till after the transfer because then I just got to wipe it all out of you. But otherwise, yeah, if it's later in the day, do it whenever you need to. What size should the follicles be before triggering for an egg retrieval for IVF? Um, well, uh, with us and based on the majority of studies that are out there, 18 to 20, 17 to 20 is the ideal size. Um, a lot of programs I know of, in particular one in Toronto, um, wait much, much longer. That's insane. Like there's one program that just doesn't care. They wait till the follicles are like 23, 24. Apparently their lab is only open three days a week, um, or at least it was during the pandemic. So you cannot get good results running an IVF center like that, and they're not. Um, so you can't run cycles like that. It just doesn't work. What are your recommendations on reverting back to IUI after five failed IVF? Age 30, not explained in particular. Wow. Um, okay, so first of all, I am so sorry for what you've gone through. Um, I would recommend you see us because that doesn't make sense. And going backwards to IUI doesn't make any sense. That's not going to work. So um, if you've already done a bunch of IVF five times, 
going to IUI will not help you. You need to either explore what's wrong or you need to consider using donor for one of you or a surrogate or whatever the case is. But um, going back to IUI will not work if you failed five cycles of IVF. So uh, that's another challenge case. So call me, text me, email me, um, email info at Dr. Victory, get a consult. Let's figure out what we can do to help you. We, we kind of became known in Toronto for doing the cases that nobody else could solve. Um, now that I'm here, we're still known for doing the cases that nobody else can solve. So people from all over the place come to us when they um, can't get pregnant elsewhere and we get them pregnant just because we pay attention to the details, not because I'm, you know, waving some kind of wizard wand in the lab or something like that. You have the wizard wand. <laughs> I'm not even going there. <laughs> Thank you to you and your staff today at the Windsor Clinic during my retrieval. Top-notch care. It was such a great evidence experience, even through my right ovary was hiding. Oh. We were so thankful we did our research and chose you 21 eggs retrieved. I know. And you killed me in the process, but I love you. So congratulations. <laughs> I'm very happy for you. And thank you for being such an amazing trooper because... Um, Despite all the meds we gave you, I still felt like I was torturing you a bit and I hate torturing people. So you are my hero and a true warrior if ever there was one. So lots of those little hearts for all of the, you, all those of you out there who are watching and thumbs up. Um, she is the most shining example of tough uh, I've seen in a long time. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm finished. Okay, here it is. How does the retroverted shaped uter uterus affect fertility? It doesn't affect fertility at all. Um, it's very difficult to do an embryo transfer into. And so we actually mastered doing transvaginal ultrasound guided embryo transfers for patients that have a retroverted uterus, because then I can see it beautifully and it's easy to do the transfer. Um, I was at another fertility center uh, not too long ago where um, the lady's uterus was retroverted um, and they took the uh, ultrasound probe, abdominal ultrasound probe. And honestly, I, I thought they were going to puncture through her belly. Like they were pushing so hard. And I was like, yeah, we don't need to do that. So I actually showed them how to do it with transvaginal and they hadn't seen it. Like it was amazing. So um, we do that all the time. I did two today that way. Um, and it works great. You get a beautiful view. Even when it's difficult, you can see clearly and then it's super easy to manage. So um, we mastered that a long time ago. It works really, really well. We haven't had any problems with it. I'm 41. I've had two miscarriages, one chemical pregnancy in the last two years, and I've had one failed IUI and started the first IVF. Okay. What is the chance of success to give birth? How many IVFs do you need to do to get success? Embryo math answers that. <laughs> so um, watch our YouTube video called Embryo Math, uh, which will explain that to you. Um, on average, at 41, three cycles are going to be necessary to get one live birth. Um, that's the calculation. That's using an average lab with an average patient. If you're better than average or your lab is better than average, it skews the numbers in your favor. And conversely, if your lab is not that great or unfortunately your ovaries are not behaving as well as we would like them to, that'll skew the numbers in the wrong direction. So average expect three, um, depends on how strong your AMH is and so on. Uh, to be clear about melatonin, <clears throat> should I take it leading up to an embryo transfer and also during the two week wait after? So you through the whole pregnancy, it'll help you sleep better. Don't stop. I'm a big believer that no one should stop any um, medications that they uh, use in pregnancy with, with some exceptions. Um, because I think pregnancy likes balance or what we call homeostasis and adding and taking things away just like disrupts it. And um, I don't like doing that. Earthquakes for embryos is is not really a lot of fun. We like just stability. So um, I like keeping things calm and the less changes you have, the better off you are. How far are you booking into for the initial consult? Um, I would answer, but I'm quite sure that first thing tomorrow morning, Mara would 
execute me. So I am going to say that um, it's reasonable and we triage all of the consults. Um, and if there's something that needs to be done urgently, you can reach out to me and I will triage it myself and I will figure it out. So DM me or email me or whatever, uh, but um, get a hold of me and I will figure it out and we can go from there. So you can reach me on uh, Instagram by DM. Um, I look at all of those myself um, and I answer everybody myself, even though it's insane because I do it 24 seven. Nine o'clock. One more question, Tarek's terminal question, and, okay. then, and then we eat. Let me, let me get one here. You want to pick a good one? Are there still a million? No, not, not a million, but there's more than one. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay. Hi, Dr. Victory. Thank you so much for doing these lives. My pleasure. In the case of RIF, what testing would you suggest? I've just failed my second FET. My embryos are untested. We are the recipients of donor embryos. We did have one successful cycle in 2019, and our son is 21 months old, oh, but cute. didn't have success with the last remaining embryo in that batch, my son's biological sibling. We now have matched with new donors, and they are 30 and 31 years old. We are really defeated and terrified of another failure. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, we have all the tests we do. I can list them for you. So we do a thrombophilia screen. Uh, we do a saline infusion sauna histogram. We check all your hormones, especially your thyroid. We check your vitamin levels, in particular D, um, B12, ferritin. Um, those are all important. Um, we check for infection in your uterus. So we use fertilisys for that. Um, I'm not a huge Emma and Alice fan just because I don't love the, the background behind that. Um, but we use Fertilisys, they do a good job. Um, we will explore immune issues as well. We also do that through Fertilisys only because they're cheaper. Um, so any of those things are on the table um, and we figure it out based on those. Now, the other question is, is there a surgical reason? Um, is there endometriosis? Is there some other cause? Uh, so I guess I'd want to know more about your history, but that's our protocol. We look at vitamin levels. We look at, um, we even look at your stress levels. So vitamins, your psychological status, thrombophilia screen, hormones, in particular thyroid. Um, we'll look at your uterus very closely. If you had a C-section last time, you want to check for an isthmocele, that can affect things. Uh, we'll do your immune panel. We'll do an infectious panel. Um, those are the general things we look at. Um, of course, it depends on what your embryo transfer protocol was like as well, because our protocol involves a lot of monitoring and we check your progesterone levels very carefully. We check your response to the progesterone very carefully. Um, so we're like hyper vigilant about what's going on. Yeah. So consider all of that when you're looking at things. We're done. Okay, so thank you for watching Fertility Factor Fiction. Um, I am going to start posting more on Instagram. Uh, I hope you liked my funny reel about surgery. And um, no, I have never had a nose ring. You can both see my sides of my nostril. <laughs> so I've never dropped a nose ring in a patient before. Don't worry. Um, I hope you guys have a great evening. For the love of God, ignore the crazy people spewing nonsense about vaccination and get vaccinated. Um, and I wish you all very, very well, be safe. And if you have really interesting cases or you want to bounce, um, what's going on off of me, I'm more than happy to do it. The one message I would like to leave you all with is I hate people getting abused and, um, taken advantage of. You do not need to pay a fortune to do IVF. That's ridiculous. So if a center in Toronto or anywhere for that matter is charging you an arm and a leg more than any other center, it's not worth the proximity. Like, I'm not saying you need to come to us, okay? You can go anywhere else that you want, but don't spend double what everybody else is paying or even 50% more than everybody else is paying just so you can stay in Toronto. People think Toronto is better because it's bigger. It's just not true. We have much higher success rates than many places do. So. Um, go somewhere where they're treating you right. That's the number one thing you can do, guys, and, and where they have great success because they listen to you and they actually listen to your body and they treat you like 
people instead of dollar signs. So have a good night. I hope that message resounds with some of you. And if you need my help, reach out. I'm here to help.